Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, so welcome back. And so this uh, session is a regulator's panel. And um, so this is the second time that we have this regulator's panel at the annual FinTech conference. Uh, last year we did it virtually and then we kind of did it very cover more broad topics, uh, kind of all things FinTech. Uh, fintech lending, uh, alternative data, uh, third-party vendor risk, uh, and AI, ML, pretty much everything was covered. And um, interconnectedness, cloud computing, uh, financial stability. Now this year, it's gonna be very different. We want to focus this year uh, discussion on crypto, um, and crypto-related activities. And not only the, at the depository institutions, but also at non-bank institutions as well, because we know that uh, some of the regulators here uh, actually supervise non-bank platforms as well. And uh, I'm sure you all know that uh, the crypto market was growing exponentially before it crashed earlier this year, around uh, in May. And um, a lot of this growth actually was because of small retail investors were actually part of this big, uh, major uh, growth. It is important to recognize though that uh, every time that uh, investors put money in the uh, crypto, they don't, they don't know it, they were not aware of it, but basically they were also investing in the platform itself. And uh, as you heard earlier this morning, that the largest platform and many others actually are not regulated. So what we see now is that many of the platforms are uh, filing for bankruptcy and some of them are freezing their uh, customers' account. So a lot of small investors and retail customers are being hurt, right? Some of them actually lost their uh, lifetime uh, saving and uh, we, uh, we don't know where it is going right now because we are in pretty much uncharted territory. And uh, so as regulators, we think about what we can do to help protect consumers and the financial system. Regulators around the globe are trying to figure out what would be the best way to regulate crypto or stable and stable coin. And as you also heard this morning that every decision in the design involves a trade off. So it's not easy and also moving parts. It's uh, some people said it's kind of like trying to, uh, repair an airplane when it is still flying in the air. So it's not, it's not easy. In addition, these crypto activities also move around. And as we have seen evidence in China, for example, when Bitcoin mining was banned, that it moved to other places around the globe. So uh, it is very important that regulators work together to collaborate, coordinate our policies. Ideally, we would have this global consensus on crypto regulations, but that's hardly going to, it would not be possible, right? So at least in the US today, what we are doing is to show you that we have this six, or regulators from six agencies here together on the same stage to show you that we are actually working together, we coordinate our, our guidance and policy, and, and so uh, it would be, it would be fun to hear what, what these regulators are doing in response to this crypto crisis. Now, uh, the rightmost speaker is Yaniv Gershon from uh, Boston Fed, but Yaniv has a re leading role now in um, running the Federal Reserve uh, Supervisory Program for FinTech. And uh, so Yaniv would introduce himself and will uh, we'll talk a little bit about the SFSP, the Supervision Program uh, for the Fed. And we will, you all will have time to ask questions, at least 10 minutes. So if you can start thinking about what you want to ask, uh, that would be good, right? Okay. Julafa, thank you so much. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Yaniv Gershon. I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, and I'm leading a, a newly established program that we have uh, at the, uh, the Federal Reserve, and that's the System FinTech Supervision Program. Uh, we are uh, tasked with enhancing our capabilities to really uh, identify, monitor, and, and uh, think about and, and help 
our su supervision to resolve the issues that are arising from fintech related activities. We are, we are covering quite a bit of, of fintech, uh, artificial intelligence, everything else, buy now, pay later, that was mentioned at the beginning. But a really large portion of what we cover is crypto related activities as well. And even more recently than the time that we established ourselves, we established a crypto task force. And a, a number of our members are even here in the room with us, others probably listening in on, on, the, uh, uh, on the WebEx. Uh, and the task force is tasked with the same thing as our own program, but it is to really build our capacity within the system to really supervise the banking activities as they relate to crypto. So, uh, so that's us, and I'll let each one of the panelists here and on the screen uh, introduce themselves and we'll go into some questions. Okay, my name is Kevin Greenfield. I am the Deputy Comptroller for Operational Risk Policy at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. And essentially my team is responsible for developing guidance statements, uh, policy, um, general policy statements, as well as our examination man manuals in all areas dealing with bank information technology, payment systems risk, critical infrastructure and cybersecurity, and general governance and operations risk policy. Given the tech and payment side, we work very closely with our Office of Innovation at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency um, to um, develop emerging or identify emerging trends in FinTech and develop appropriate policies, procedures, and guidance for both financial institutions as well as our examination staff. Great, thanks. I'm Greg Gilzinis. I'm an advisor to CFPB Director Rohit Chopra and I'm glad to be on the panel with my state and federal colleagues. I think the two things that I'd like folks to, to come away from uh, my comments here today, one, our consumer protection framework is tech neutral. You know, we're ready to deploy our full panoply of supervisory, regulatory, and enforcement authorities to the extent crypto products and services constitute consumer financial products and services, and we'll get a little bit into that distinction later or otherwise fall into our jurisdiction. You know, we're regulators. We're not here to cheerlead any one technology or preference any one technology over another. You know, we're, we take a tech neutral approach. Then the second point I want to raise is that at the CFPB, we're preparing for and, and, and ready for, uh, you know, a future payments landscape that involves frictionless, real-time payments for, uh, for consumers. Now, that landscape can include, uh, you know, a mix of, of technologies, whether it's FedNow, which, you know, we heard about earlier and, and very excited for that to come live next year, real-time payment systems that the private sector has put together a potential digital uh, currency from our from our central bank or other crypto instruments you know we'll be ready for uh, the future of payments whatever combination of of those uh, may come to be so anyway excited for for the discussion thank you very much and, I, and i'll go in the order that i see on my screen here so caitlin if you don't mind uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so my name is Caitlin Azra. I'm the Executive Deputy Superintendent over Research and Innovation uh, for the New York Department of Financial Services. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep, okay. Um, so thank you to Jalapa and, and the Philadelphia Fed for um, the opportunity to be here. It's, it's a pleasure to be on a panel with former colleagues and, and the other agencies I've worked with for a long time. Uh, so my office is responsible for economic research and reporting. We also have an innovation policy office and then virtual currency licensing and supervision. So this is some of that oversight of the non-bank entities in the virtual currency space that Jalapa mentioned. Uh, DFS also supervises our state chartered banks and insurance companies, but those are run out of sister divisions that I also support. Um, and I think what's interesting is my role gives me the ability to think about policy and that kind of innovation piece alongside the licensing and supervision of the virtual currency space, which I think is really valuable as we think about guidance and kind of cutting edge issues. Um, so I'm just gonna spend a second and kind of overview how we supervise the virtual currency space for any of you who aren't familiar with the Department of Financial Services kind of framework. So we have uh, the bit license program and the limited purpose trust charter. Close system. this is the microphone. One second, Caitlin. If it's if it's I don't know if it's possible just to have it at least on on the on the uh, right here. We can't hear her very well. I don't know if I, 
Could you also speak closer to the microphone? Yeah. Me? Yeah, I can try. Um, so the, the bit license program um, is an activity based regime under our financial services law, and that covers all virtual currency business activity in New York state. So this is our ability to regulate everything from virtual currency exchanges to Bitcoin ATMs to white label service providers. Um, they also, these entities also require a money transmission license to hold and move to move fiat money. Um, and we don't allow for lending or rehab provocation. So most other states directly regulate virtual currency through money transmission, but at DFS, we don't allow this and have actually designed and enacted the bit license framework to provide a comprehensive bank like oversight approach. Um, and then our limited purpose trust charters, these are depository entities under our banking law and must operate in a fiduciary capacity. These entities can take uh, fiat deposits, just not from the general public. Um, and these entities don't need to have a separate money transmission license. So we use both of these um, frameworks to really regulate the virtual currency space. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here and excited to talk more with my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. And, and, and next, Kavita. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, uh, I'm Kavita Jain. I head up the innovation policy function within the division of soup and reg here at the Federal Reserve Board. I uh, work very, very closely with Yaniv, uh, who's on the supervisory side, and I'm on the policy side uh, on all things uh, fintech. Um, many thanks to uh, the Philadelphia Reserve Bank and to Jalapa for organizing this event. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, and just, I, I guess I'll give the standard disclaimer uh, before I forget. I am speaking here today in my personal capacity and the views that I shared today are mine, not necessarily um, those of the Federal Reserve. Um, and I'll spend just a couple of minutes just talking about uh, the Innovation Policy Office here. Um, as you heard, Kevin, and, and you'll hear, hear uh, uh, our other regulators, Caitlin and others, uh, talk about, um, you know, our, our collective, I guess, goal here is to help facilitate responsible innovation. We recognize that uh, technological innovations can bring tremendous benefits to consumers, to banks, uh, to our economy overall, uh, if it is undertaken in a safe and sound and compliant manner. So. Um, you know, as such, our office uh, focuses on a range of issues. Yaniv talked about uh, how we are looking at and exploring uh, how our supervised institutions are using technologies like AI, blockchain, uh, cloud. Uh, we're also looking at a growing a range of business models, including uh, different partnerships models that are evolving as the industry is seeking to innovate. Um, we are also exploring ways that we can provide practical rule, tools and resources for firms, particularly for smaller firms, uh, to, uh, to help uh, facilitate innovation. And then finally, uh, industry engagement is a key a core component of the work we do. Um, we host both structured and, and unstructured forums uh, to engage with the range of stakeholders, of course, financial institutions, uh, fintechs, vendors, academic uh, experts, consumer advocates, et cetera. We host uh, office hours, academic symposiums. Um, and then I, I guess last but not the least, uh, as you, as is evidenced uh, from this group of fellow regulators here, uh, we collaborate extensively uh, with regulators, state, federal, domestic, international, really to understand uh, the types of activities we're seeing uh, financial institutions engage in, the risks they may pose, and think about uh, where possible uh, establishing a coordinated approach. So I'm looking forward to the discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kavita. And uh, Rayanne, if you don't mind. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I can't see you, so maybe you can confirm you can hear me. Yeah, we yes. hear you well. Thank you. I can't see you. 
Um, so thanks again. And I really do also wish uh, to, that I could be there in person. Philadelphia is one of my favorite cities of, of all cities. So um, maybe next time uh, I'm actually uh, on vacation this week. So I'm coming to you from uh, 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 Wyoming uh, uh, today. So it's very interesting. Um, I'm Ray Ann Miller. I am the senior deputy director um, of risk management supervision at the FDIC. And um, you know, going after my colleagues, I, I'll have a lot of the same things to uh, to, to tell you about uh, what we do here at the FDIC and how we how we supervise for these uh, emerging areas. Um, but just a little bit of background about me um, as senior deputy director. I am on both the supervisory and policy side. We we uh, organize ourselves around risk verticals at the FDIC, and I uh, oversee the general safety and soundness uh, risk vertical. So I oversee um, safety and soundness examinations, applications, and enforcement actions for the institutions we supervise, and I also oversee uh, general um, supervisory uh, policy and uh, regulations. In the general safety and soundness area, so credit risk, uh, third party risk, uh, broker deposits, those types of uh, things fall in my area. And um, much like um, uh, Kavita was just discussing, you know, we, um, we, uh, we're very interested in understanding the risks. Uh, uh, not a lot of our institutions are currently actively engaging in, in crypto related activities, but we're very interested in understanding the risks. Uh, this area is evolving rapidly. Uh, and, um, you know, we want to make sure we understand the risks uh, that banks are presenting uh, to be able to provide appropriate um, guidance to them and guidance to our examiners on, on how to uh, how to mitigate that risk to the to the deposit insurance fund. So, you know, I look forward to a great discussion today and um, uh, that's the end of my prepared remarks. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ray Ann. And finally, Adam. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Adam Wright. Uh, I'm an attorney with our uh, department's new innovation office. Uh, I, I work at the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. Uh, we are the all in one state financial regulator in California. Uh, we oversee everything from banking to securities to even general financial products and services with authority similar to that of the CFPB and the FTC. Uh, as you may have seen, uh, in May, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom uh, issued an executive order on blockchain and crypto. Uh, that order directed my department, the DFPI, to undertake a number of projects uh, to help create a more comprehensive regulatory approach to crypto financial products and to provide better clarity to stakeholders on the DFPI's expectations when it comes to crypto and blockchain. Uh, critically, uh, the governor directed the DFPI to first engage with stakeholders and collect public input on what we should prioritize in our approach. Uh, the first step in that process is an invitation for comment that we issued last month. Uh, comments on that are due by the end of this week. Uh, and I'm going to discuss more about the specific crypto projects that the DFPI is undertaking now later in the panel. So appreciate the invite. Thank you all. Thanks again, and thanks everyone. And I think we'll dive in into a few of the questions, uh, and then uh, we, we have about 20 minutes that we try to go through the questions and then we'll open it up uh, for, for the crowd right here. Uh, what, the first question that we have here is, is one of the things, and it was interesting because it came up even during our lunch table, you know, two, two years, two, three years ago, you would go to financial institutions and you will ask them about their interaction with the crypto related activities. And everyone would say, no, no, you're not really, it's not for us. We don't really understand that. And in the past, uh, for sure, in the past year, there's really an increase in activities. Either the banks are already or institutions in general are, are either active or exploring uh, uh, to be uh, to exploring for the future and want to be active in those those activities. Can you talk a bit about your agency's focus right now, given given the uh, uh, I, I don't want to call it exploding because it's not exploding yet relative to outside of the banking. But definitely a lot of interest. If you can talk a bit about about what the agency is focusing on, uh, what you're worried mostly about, and what are the risks that you're concerned. Sorry, Kevin, I'm I'm looking at you. So if you, yeah, don't mind starting. Sure, no, I, I, absolutely. And at the OCC, we very much uh, have been supportive of responsible innovation in the banking system. And when looking at the crypto assets, and especially when looking at the events of the past two months. There are opportunities here, but there also is a lot of, there are risks as well. 
And from the OCC's perspective, we are taking a careful and cautious approach to crypto and crypto assets. And definitely we have expectations that financial, that the financial institutions we supervise take that same approach. We've come out with our interpretive letters, identifying key areas of clarifying permissibility of um, several activities that banks can engage in. But we also note um, the importance of communication with their supervisory office and receiving that non-supervisory objection. And that's to make sure that the activities that a bank may be considering, one, one are permissible, and second, that um, there are effective risk management and controls in place for the safe and sound operation of that activity, as well as looking at what are the consumer protections or customer protections there. It's interesting because there's a lot of discussion around this, but actually a lot of what we're seeing for crypto in the banking system is limited, but at interest, there's a lot of discussion and um, we do receive inquiries and um, I think everyone is looking at what are the potential business applications, what is the economic value, and what are the opportunities available for both banks and their customers and again, making sure that any um, activities that are occurring within the federal banking system are done in that safe and sound manner with consumer protection. I think one of the key messages I would leave for any of the institutions, industry groups, or, or such, is communication is the most important thing. And to be communicating with your supervisory office, with your regulator, whether it's the OCC or any of the other agencies here, having that communication, discussing and understanding the risks and what are the control frameworks, and going about this in a very responsible, but also a, a cautious, cautious approach is what I would give advice to. Thanks, Kevin. So it sounds, it sounds like the, the focus is, given the fact that you have the interpretive letters, so that, that's definitely the area that you get most questions and comments. And then in addition to that, you're seeing you're seeing elements and, and inquiries about areas outside of, there, of the there, letters. Yeah. There absolutely is interest, obviously, with the events yeah. of the recent months that has tapered a little. Yeah. But there there is interest because, the, to your point, uh, there was a continued growth in this area. But, but again, a lot of this is looking at it, but also evaluating those risks, understanding the risk to the institution, also understanding the risk to the consumer and to the customer. Yep. Thank you, Greg. Great, thanks. So look, generally we have not seen large scale adoption of crypto related products and services that are used primarily for personal family or household use. And that's really the critical phrase uh, in Dodd-Frank that determines whether a financial product or service is a consumer financial product or service and then falls within uh, sort of the new suite of, of Title 10 authorities that we have, which includes a prohibition on, uh, you know, actions that are unfair, deceptive, uh, or abusive, UDAP, uh, for, for short. Most of the crypto ecosystem today is either directly or indirectly um, you know, related to speculative investment activities. So given that use case in the ecosystem, applying our authorities really requires a fact-specific analysis of individual uh, product and services to see if they you know, come within, uh, within our jurisdiction. Now, We've certainly seen claims that crypto-related assets, primarily stable coins, could revolutionize the future of consumer payments, and we have not seen that uh, to date, at least, uh, at least not yet. Uh, people aren't buying a sandwich or paying their rent uh, in, in crypto, but we are well positioned to enforce the relevant consumer laws to the extent that stable coins or other crypto-related assets are ever used for, as a primary uh, consumer payment method, which we do think is possible, especially if it were ever to ride the rails of, uh, of big tech, uh, for example. I mean, we almost uh, saw that with, uh, with Facebook's DM uh, Libra project, which was, was really a, a near disaster and a, a near miss in our opinion. Um, now, we have monitored some of these digital asset platforms as they've uh, offered traditional consumer financial product and services that are tied to the account. So traditional consumer loans, debit cards, and credit cards. 
and generally speaking, our consumer protection framework does apply uh, to those traditional consumer financial products or services that are tied to those crypto accounts, again, with the caveat that a lot of this analysis is sort of fact and circumstance um, specific. As to, to the risks, I think one thing uh, I wanted to mention that we've really seen in the past year is a lot of uh, crypto-related companies making representations about how FDIC deposit insurance covers or relates to crypto accounts or, or products. And I know uh, Rayanne and colleagues at the FDIC have have spent a lot of time and done a lot of good work on this. Um, and I can't discuss any specific firms or comment on any ongoing investigations, but the CFPB has observed that a range of institutions have made uh, certain claims about deposit insurance that at, uh, at best are misleading, at, at, at worst could be potentially um, you know, false. Um, so this is just one of the main risks we've seen. We responded to it by issuing an enforcement circular um, in May and, and we'll continue to, to monitor it. I would add that uh, in the beginning of this year, the, some reports actually show that at least uh, several hundred banks would start offering crypto products to their customers uh, through partnership with FinTech platform. And of course, it didn't really happen. It was supposed to happen in that one quarter, in the second quarter, but then because of Terra crash in May. Uh, but the New York DFS actually has approved some of these platforms to operate and some of them started to partner with banks. So I thought I would take her to uh, Caitlin to talk about this. Yeah, thank you, Jalapa. Hopefully I fixed my, my audio, apologies for that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, you know, as Jalapa said, you know, what we're focused on and, and like the CFPB is able to do in California, you know, we're going directly into the virtual currency entities and, and kind of um, regulating them as such. So overall, DFS is focused on um, what I would say is, is kind of, um, you know, guidance and, and putting clear baseline standards down um, for the virtual currency space. So we've been doing this for almost a decade now, uh, since 2015, in terms of the direct regulation, and that has allowed us to see a lot of kind of what's becoming longer term trends in terms of business models and the risks associated with those. Uh, that's enabled us to put out things like our stablecoin guidance to really say, you know, this is what we expect and um, where we want to see the, the standards um, for our entities, and then we can always layer on top of that. So that is a key focus for um, the, the agency right now. I'll just talk about some of the other areas that we're thinking about. And again, this is for our regulation of the virtual currency entities themselves. And then, you know, I think that helps banking regulators, including DFS, hopefully when they, when those entities go to partner with banks, really understand what is the diligence that, that those parties are going uh, through. So we're doing, um, a large effort around capitalization right now, which I think is obviously essential during this crypto downturn. Um, all of our entities are required to have capitalization um, in the event of kind of wind down costs, any issues with regard to kind of their own stability in uh, a more volatile market. Um, we have that that's really case by case, depending on the business model, but we're standardizing that and you'll see guidance from us in the near future. Uh, this is, again, distinct from, let's say, reserve requirements for a stable coin. Uh, this is actual capital on hand for the entities themselves to create that stability. Um, we're looking into bankruptcy treatment, you know, how the virtual currency assets are treated in the event of bankruptcy and protecting consumers. Um, continuing on that, disclosures and consumer protection and look forward to working closely with our colleagues at the CFPB and beyond. Um, and then, of course, we're partnering with our banking division and with all of our federal counterparts here um, on how our banking entities that are state chartered in New York handle, you know, virtual currency activities that they might want to engage with or their own partnerships. Um, but happy to talk more about uh, kind of our framework if that's not responsive, Jalapa. Thank you so much. And uh, if we can maybe transition, I'm, I'm trying to not go through the same order all the time. Maybe Rayanne, do you mind taking it, uh, providing your comments? Sure. Thanks, Neve. Um, appreciate it. Uh, so at the FDIC, uh, the, our approach is, is very similar to what was described by, by Kevin. And Kevin and I and Kavita, we all work very closely together. So I hate to repeat uh, some of the things that they've said, but we, um, 
uh, we're very concerned um, at the FDIC about uh, risks to our supervised institutions. And uh, we're very concerned uh, that the risks are not well understood. Uh, this is a rapidly evolving area. And as my, uh, my colleague Greg mentioned thus far, we haven't seen a business uh, case um, for, for banks um, to be um, you know, actively involved in a uh, product that is primarily used for investment and speculation at this point. Doesn't mean that innovations uh, won't um, come forth in the future, um, but that's kind of where our lens is. We're, we're, we're certainly concerned about the risks. Um, and our approach to uh, addressing that is, um, you know, back in uh, April of this year, we issued a uh, letter to our supervised institutions um, asking them to notify us of uh, their intention to engage in crypto related activities um, or their, um, or if they already were engaging uh, to let us know uh, what they were doing. And so um, we mention in our letter some of our concerns about the risks, and the risks really run the um, the gamut: uh, safety and soundness risks, which I am most uh, familiar with. That's sort of what I do here at the FDIC. Um, but also consumer uh, protection, uh, consumer harm, uh, consumer confusion, which I'll get into in just a second with our most recent uh, advisory that we issued. Um, but we're very concerned about sort of the day risks um, presented by the, these um, new activities. So we want to make sure we understand what banks are doing. Uh, we'll provide supervisory feedback as appropriate. Um, and, you know, discuss uh, general risks with uh, our, our other uh, uh, regulators, fellow regulators, and from there we uh, we could determine that further instruction is is necessary for our. Uh, examiners or guidance for our, our, our entities. Uh, but right now we're really certainly trying to take a ground up approach and un really understand risks. And as we're doing this, I'm, I didn't have the benefit of attending the conference and having these luncheon conferences, but obviously what's going on in the market uh, is, is, um, is of interest to us. And you all know that there's an executive order outstanding uh, where there are a number of uh, reports and things that are are being prepared um, as a government. So we're participating, uh, watching that, but from the FDIC, we are um, definitely taking a grassroots approach. Uh, so that's sort of our, our notification letter. And then uh, just last week, we issued an advisory uh, to our supervised uh, entities um, to address uh, misrepresentations of deposit insurance. Uh, Greg kind of got into it a little bit. Um, but we, we just advise uh, insured uh, institutions that they need to understand how deposit insurance works and uh, advise them that uh, to avoid um, risks in this area if to the extent that they are dealing with uh, crypto companies and simpler types of companies, that it would behoove them to um, monitor those, those activities, monitor what uh, those companies are saying about the uh, the bank and about deposit insurance, uh, and we describe some of the risks that we believe that they present. So that is um, that is our approach, um, and happy to uh, to discuss further as we get into this conversation. Thanks, Yanif. Three and and maybe uh, we can have uh, Adam talk a bit about uh, what we have what we see in the California side, uh, and then and then Kavita and, and Frank, Frank. We had many more questions, which I, I don't think. Yeah, we'll we be going able to start uh, taking questions from in the five floor. minutes. In five minutes. So, well, I think after after uh, Adam and Kavita, we'll go to uh, to the folks here. Sure. And uh, but one of our focuses right now is is like I said, providing regulatory clarity. Uh, we don't believe that uncertainty over California's opinion on new products and services should be a barrier to responsible innovation. So we're going to do our best to make sure that we can provide input and expectations. Uh, to inform that, we're taking a number of steps. For example, last week, we just issued a survey to our licensed banks, credit unions, and trust companies to help get feedback from our licensees about uh, what their plans are and also what they want to see in terms of feedback from us so that we understand what we need to prioritize in our guidance. Uh, also critical for us, uh, we do not have a non-bank crypto prudential law right now. We are not using money transmission in that way. Uh, so we are leading with consumer protection uh, on that front. 
Uh, and two in particular I'd, I'd highlight because they're core components of our governor's executive order are a focus on making sure that companies uh, instill equity and inclusion in their products that they're rolling out. And also that they're thinking about climate risk and how and how best to disclose that. Uh, finally, one last thing that is a priority based upon the governor's executive order is making sure that we harmonize with other federal and state agencies. Uh, and we're taking a number of steps to make sure that we stay in sync and that we don't allow a patchwork to uh, otherwise inhibit uh, responsible innovation. Thank you, Adam. And, and finally, Kavita, if you can talk a bit about what we see from see from the Fed side in terms of the type of activities that banks are engaged in or exploring. Sure. So, um, you know, I think I, I echo a lot of what has already been shared um, by others, but, you know, the 1 thing I think about is um, when we see our supervised uh, institutions, which, by the way, I agree, we are seeing uh, our supervised institutions uh, interested, but they're not uh, jumping in. Many are approaching this area cautiously, just given the nascency and, and the complexity. Uh, and the wide range of risks uh, involved. And so when we uh, talk to those entities that are exploring this, um, you know, I, I try to think of, you know, it's it's a whole spectrum. Some are just offering traditional banking products like cash deposit accounts or lending. Others want to facilitate uh, buying and selling of crypto assets like Bitcoin. Uh, some want to custody assets and some are just exploring the underlying technology and want nothing to do with the likes of Bitcoin and Ether, right? And so depending on the type of activity, I think there are a lot of common risks, but the uh, some risks I think are super heightened uh, depending on the type of activities. So, you know, um, and again, both, I think, again, uh, Ray and Kevin touched on this. We look at it both from the safety and soundness angle, but also from consumer protection angle. Um, so, it, for example, uh, engaging in uh, facilitating trading of crypto assets, those pose, as we've seen, you know, through recent events, uh, significant volatility risks, uh, consumer compliance risks, as BSA, uh, AML risks, etc. For those entities that want to explore stablecoin type of arrangements, I think Greg Greg talked a little bit about the DM proposal. Um, depending on how the arrangements are established, they could pose broader risks to the, uh, you know, greater financial stability, uh, uh, consumer harm. They could pose a disruption to payment systems. So I just highlight that just to, just to kind of you know share that we're focused on the different types of activities and the unique kind of risks um, that those activities could pose. Um, and then on the policy side, uh, we are working uh, closely uh, with, uh, as Ryan and Kevin mentioned, with the OCC and the FDIC really to understand the types of uh, activities our supervised institutions are engaging in, what are the risks, what are we seeing with respect to risk management practices. Um, we're also working on, uh, as uh, there was a joint statement that was put out late last, uh, last year following the crypto policy sprints. Um, so we continue to think about areas where we can provide greater clarity to the industry, both with respect to legal permissibility, but also considerations on whether certain activities uh, or how certain activities can be conducted in a safe and sound manner. So uh, one last point I'll make is just you know, very specific to your question, custody, trading, crypto collateralized lending, stable coins, uh, these are really the key kind of use cases uh, or types of activities that we're focused on. We've also been thinking hard about uh, uh, potential capital and regulatory framework to the extent you know these activities or assets uh, uh, are held on balance sheet. Which there's a legal permissibility question there as well. But we've been working very closely with the Basel Committee that's put out a consultation paper uh, in this space. So just all that to say a wide spectrum of activities, wide spectrum of risks, and a lot of work going on uh, to monitor them. Thank you. Fantastic. 
And uh, if uh, I think it will be a good time now to, to move and, and get any questions uh, that the uh, folks here have. And when you raise your hand, if you don't mind, just pointing out who do you want exactly to answer. Otherwise, I will just let everyone answer and we'll have one question. So uh, please. Uh, this is for the CFPB. Um, we've talked about potential consumer protections for crypto payments. Uh, consumers currently use credit and debit cards, which have significant protections under Truth of Lending and Electronic Fund Transfer Act. For a crypto payment, which is decentralized, has the Bureau thought about how we could apply TILA and EFTA-type protections to these transactions, or is that, does that require an act of Congress, or is it not feasible because they're decentralized? No, it, it's a good question. And first, I want to comment on the point you made about the debit cards and the credit cards that are often tied to these crypto accounts. What often happens, I can't say in every instance, but when a transaction is made with a merchant, the crypto asset is sold and converted into U.S. dollars before the transaction actually occurs. And so then it looks just like a traditional debit or credit transaction and Reggie in, in the, the standard, uh, you know, consumer protections likely apply, again, I, you know, to use the facts and circumstances um, caveat. When it comes to some of the other, um, you know, payment uh, potential use cases that, as you say, are more decentralized, I think first we want to point out that we toss around the word decentralized quite a bit in our analysis of the ecosystem. It actually looks fairly centralized, whether it's in certain of these protocols, the governance token concentrations among, um, you know, a, a few big players or, um, or other ways where, you know, a DeFi protocol has a development team, like it starts to look fairly concentrated. Um, in cases, you know, though in the future where there are these sort of novel consumer payments use case, we're going to be ready to make sure that this, the same consumer protections that currently apply um, to traditional instruments apply to, to those. Our statute is tech neutral. Yeah, Bill Spaniel. Thanks so much. Um, this is also a question for CFPB. Uh, well, maybe not. Uh, maybe the FDIC person can answer this. Um, kind of like on the same vein of the disclosures and the protections, for crypto-related transactions effectuated through debit cards specifically, and uh, and sort of like the the announcement put out on the MCB uh, the Voyager situation. Can you talk about um, if the FDIC is considering like model forms and uh, kind of like sample language that uh, banks should use when disclosing? to consumers the extent of FDIC protection, given what you just said, right, that the crypto is converted into fiat just at the time of the transaction. So really the entire crypto balance should never be considered to be in the activity account. So I think is, is the question, uh, is there a consideration to amend any of the languages that, that banks need to disclose? Yes. Yeah. Well, Additional information, Ray and I don't know if you have any any thoughts there in terms of the agency's thinking in terms of given now with the with what we experience with the Metropolitan Commercial Bank. Uh, can you hear and, me? Yep, I can. Can you hear us? I think we'll not know that answer. We'll all be in suspense here. You know, if I, if I could, I, I don't. Geneva, are you prefer. there? Uh, I am. Can, can you hear? Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, I'll step in. I won't speak for the FDIC, but I think that question and something just listening to the discussion and some of the even lunchtime discussion. One of the key things that's going to be very important here is defining and having a consistent taxonomy when we're talking about crypto, crypto assets, because so far in this discussion, I've heard crypto assets, cryptocurrency, stablecoin, virtual currency. That's confusing for myself that this is a good part of my, my day job. What about for that consumer or for that customer that sees this, uh, it's safe and sound, it's insured, it's 
it's stable, so there must be something there, and I think we've all seen that all stable coins are not necessarily stable. I, I think to ensure some of these consumer protections and clarity uh, of what is the risk and who is holding that risk, having that taxonomy is going to be very important. I keep on looking to see if Rayanne's coming back to ask the uh, disclosure question, but um, I, I, I just I think that's, yeah, yeah, thank you. I think that's a key underlining concept here is having that taxonomy. Thank you. Thanks. And Greg, maybe you'll have a. Yeah, ju just quickly on the um, misrepresentation piece. I think, look, there's a fine line between, you know, providing clarity to how novel technologies can fit within the existing framework on the one hand and then serving as the compliance department for the regulated entity on the other and so there's always um and so there's always that that balance and i think you know we at cfpb at least felt the enforcement circular we put out and i'm sure um you know Rand would say that the fdic is is comfortable with uh the financial institutions letter that they put out um that it's pretty clear to both banks and their uh, you know, crypto partners that may be institution affiliated parties understand how FDIC insurance works and how the pass through insurance works and don't mislead people. Yeah. So I just want to follow up a little on Kevin's point and I'll, I'll um, ask my state colleagues, Caitlin and Adam, to maybe opine on this since I'm a little jealous that you have much more supervisory authority uh, across the spectrum than the Fed, the OCC, or many of us. Um, crypto, and this is Kevin's point, is a lot of things. It's a security, it's an investment, it's an asset, it's a form of cash, it's a transfer of payment. I mean, it really is a financial product that meets and can meet a lot of very needs. You know, at the federal level, we supervise those types of products very differently and among very different agencies, right? A, a deposit's very different than the security, yet crypto has aspects of all these. So. I'm just wondering, particularly as you guys have gone down this path, you know, how have you tried to view this multidimensionally, the security aspects of it, the investment aspects of it, kind of the deposit aspects of it? Is, is that proving to be more challenging than you thought? Um, yeah, I'm happy to start, uh, and then maybe, um, you know, Adam, you can share what, what you're thinking on the California side, since Adam and I also talk frequently about this. Um, so, you know, I think one of the first things that, that I would just echo is the ability, at least at the state level, to have that breadth. So we're really looking at virtual currency activity holistically and not confined by whether it's a market activity, whether, you know, it needs prudential regulation, it's consumer protection. We're really covering the, the entire waterfront. Um, you know, how we approach it in New York is really through this activity lens, uh, virtual currency business activity. We use the term virtual currency because that's how it's defined in our statute um, or that's how it's listed in our statute, but obviously that can uh, be interpreted in many ways. But that breadth is important. And then what we do is we have bespoke supervisory arrangements where we go in and we look at the particular risks. If it's really prudential concerns, if it's consumer protection concerns, usually it's all of those things, market concerns, manipulation concerns. And then we are able to address all of those things in the supervisory relationship through our ongoing monitoring, through our examination, um, but really kind of that, that activity-based lens versus entity type lens gives us a lot of power to do that, but it's also very difficult, right? We're doing this in a one-off bespoke way with each of the entities. And that's where I mentioned at the beginning, you know, as we've evolved in this space over the past, you know, since 2015, we're starting to see a lot of similarities and now being able to layer on consistent guidance against all of that diversity that we're covering with our framework. And, and I would echo that I think California right now is, is thinking about it based upon activity. I don't think that we're, we're definitely not prejudging anything based upon conceptions of, of uh, you know, what, what things might look like. Uh, we're trying to understand the products best. And, and I think that that probably best describes where we're at right now is trying to best understand the products uh, to understand the use cases. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 I want to note that I think it's right is that, you know, as we regulate everything from securities to banking to everything in California, uh, we are making sure that we are cognizant and careful that we don't do something in one area 
that is somehow going to restrict access to our California consumers in another area unintentionally. And so we're trying to be very cognizant of that. I think that's why the, the governor's executive order talked about the department creating a comprehensive regulatory approach. We're not trying to do this piecemeal. Uh, and so we're definitely not trying to prejudge and we're trying to uh, assess it by use and how our can and, ha and how folks are going to be able to use them. If that helps. So I are we running out of time? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, do you want to do like one sentence for each of us? Sure. To close? Be, yeah. what, what is the takeaway? One sentence only. Caitlin? Good luck. <laughs> um, so I'll say, you know, we hope that this evolves like the dual banking framework. We think we need the state regulators to cover that waterfront on diversity of activities and the federal regulators, as they've always done, go deep. Uh, and really across the country on the specific risk areas. So looking forward to working with all my colleagues here well into the future. That's a long sentence. That's uh, <laughs> uh, Adam. Uh, this one's easy for me. Uh, come talk to us. Uh, we want to hear uh, about what you're doing in California. We want feedback on, on how you think we should approach it. And so come talk to us. Kavita. Can I just combine what both of them said? Uh, uh, you know, just encouraging firms to engage with their regulators, engage early, engage often, and as they explore this space, really important to understand the use case, value proposition, legal permissibility, and just conducting a thorough risk assessment. Great. I'll just agree with all of that. Uh, thanks for having me. Look forward to continuing the discussion throughout this conference. Kevin? Take everything Kavita said and then, and then add in, and when approaching this, take a careful, thoughtful, cautious, cautious approach, looking at the risks and staying in communication with your regulator. Yeah, Neith. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that was the message that we heard throughout. And, and for, for, I would maybe add, and I don't know if we have firms, uh, that are not necessarily just financial institutions here, but those that are serving or the partners of the financial institutions. But regulation is important and do go and, and invest in that as well, because one of the things that we do here is that those, most of them are young, young firms and they are not thinking the first thing is not, okay, what are the compliance that we need to follow? So go, go ahead and think about that early in your development because you're gonna work with these financial institutions that will require it. So this tied very nicely with the next session. Uh, the speaker is going to be, uh, is the founder and CEO of a company that has issued credit card that pays Bitcoin reward. Uh, but he's not gonna talk about Bitcoin reward, he's gonna talk about something else, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're gonna see him soon. So uh, thank you very much everyone. And uh, so the next session is coming right after Thank you guys this. on the screen, thanks.